Before I start this video, allow me to remind you all that I have a new channel for all of my anime content and I started up my own comedy channel and I'll have some announcements after I finish the video and I have a family member from the same place I am who started up his own channel about orthodox Christianity so if you like my accent, check it out just for that. With that being said, let's get back to the video. The United States had thriving manufacturing plants up until the early 1990s and high tariffs that keep the imported products from being much cheaper. But in the early 1990s, tariffs were lowered and it became far more economic for owners of factories in America to shut down their factories and reopen them somewhere with cheaper labour for maximum profits. This was usually China. But over in Europe, it is the year 1968 and the European Economic Community has removed all tariffs between its members. Since then, the European Economic Community has become the European Union and Germany, which was already one of its wealthiest members, is still the industrial heart of the EU. Although some of the other wealthier countries in the EU did lose some industry to poorer ones, like when a Swedish tyre company received EU subsidies when relocating its factories to Portugal. However, the wealthier members of the EU have largely retained the manufacturing sectors of their economies, especially when compared to the US. So how did the wealthier countries in the European economic community avoid losing a large proportion of their industrial jobs, unlike America? Well, this video will answer that question. First, there's the European Social Fund, which is enacted and paid for by the richer states, and even the rich regions within states to ensure grants to anywhere designated as an impoverished region in the EEC or later the EU are spent on equipping schools and basic infrastructure, which has made sure that the economic difference between the poorest and wealthiest countries, excluding microstates of course, in the EU is smaller than what the difference was between China and the USA in the 1990s. Another reason is that many of the wealthier countries in the EU are wealthier because they have more productive labour forces than the poorer ones. So the difference in productivity would more than cancel out the profit margin. The most important reason is probably that when poorer countries joined the EU, to avoid being put out of business, the wealthier countries made investments to make sure they could manufacture goods cheaper. For example, the German car manufacturers invested heavily in automation. So why didn't American car manufacturers do this? Well, in the short term at least, it was more profitable to relocate to China. So why wasn't relocation within the EU an option for German and other European manufacturers? Well, in addition to what I've already said, while individual regulations vary depending on the nation, all members of the EEC and later EU had to agree to a certain baseline through things like the Community Charter of the Fundamental Social Rights of Workers. With the common baseline all EU members share, the savings often aren't enough to justify all the trouble of moving facilities. Relocating manufacturing centres is expensive and time-consuming. Of course this can vary depending on the industry, as it's far easier to move a software development team than a car factory. The differences between China and the poorer nations in the EU is that China's regulatory system is substantially more pro-business. Worker protections, child labour laws, workplace safety regulations and environmental laws are substantially weaker or virtually non-existent. That all creates enough additional profit to make it worth the expense and trouble of building new facilities and since China's population is so much larger than the entire EU's that means that far more factories can be relocated there without the cost of labour increasing as rapidly as it would anywhere else. It also means that a lot of factories are close by that require each other which saves on time and cost. These two factors meant that when one of the iPhone glass screens needed to be remade, the factory woke up 10,000 workers at 2am to make sure the parts would be ready for the other factory to produce iPhones in the morning. So why does China have such a larger population and a more pro-business regulatory system? One word rice. You see, it was the primary staple for the Chinese people for most of their history, and it's a very labour-intensive crop for farming, so it required one to have a lot of children to help farm it. And it was easy to feed a family with rice, since rice is rich in calories. In comparison, wheat, which was the primary crop for Europeans, is far less labour-intensive and doesn't contain nearly as much calories. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, 
But what about Japan? I mean, rice was their main crop too. Not to mention, Japan usually looked up to China for inspiration. Sure, it has very pro-business regulations as well, but child labor is illegal there. And child labor laws aren't ignored there. So what gives? Well, they didn't abolish child labor until 1947, not too long after it lost World War II, and was still under American occupation. You see, child labor in Japan was abolished by the Americans. Another reason is that no one in Washington, D.C. is held accountable for factories moving from the Midwest. But in many EU countries, the government finds itself directly blamed for its inaction if a major employer moves from a particular place. Often the government has to intervene with various economic packages for said community being affected. Because if you don't, there are political opponents quite willing and able to do it. Considering most EU states and other political entities, like the German states, are large shareholders in many important industries. They have direct power and influence over their economic decisions. Companies can also find themselves facing both governmental and public backlash for such moves, like the suggestion that they won't be considered for any future government contracts. This creates a climate for both companies and governments to avoid outsourcing unless their potential profits are much greater. A country trying to take advantage of its fellow union members will quickly find itself blocked at higher levels for various other investment deals and such that have to be agreed centrally. For example, Volkswagen won't relocate their manufacturing centres since the German state of Lower Saxony is a shareholder in Volkswagen and wants jobs to stay in Lower Saxony, because the people of Lower Saxony vote for people who make sure jobs stay in Lower Saxony. So the board of directors, largely appointed by Lower Saxony, does what benefits Lower Saxony, because they like their jobs to stay in the board of direction and not be offshored to someone who prefers to do what their owners actually want them to do. So now we move on to the question of why the US government, or any of the various state governments in America, don't do these things. Ultimately, the US is very sensitive for anything that smacks of socialism, like using federal and state funds to support a local plant. You also have very few state-owned enterprises in the US, when in Europe it used to be eminently common with national airlines, utilities, companies, and various heavy industry beyond armament industries. The countries in the EU that don't have a national car company aren't in the majority. A large proportion of the immigrants that moved to the US moved there for religious freedom, like the Puritans and Quakers, or political freedom, like the Germans in Texas, or the Irish who wanted freedom to not starve to death. So it's only natural to think that their descendants would want economic freedom from each other too. Another reason is that a large proportion of immigrants were given large amounts of free land. So in America's genesis, there was far less desire for socialistic ideas like redistribution of land compared to Europe. Then there was the Puritans who believed that wealth generated by hard work proved your salvation, and they had a much greater influence on the US than anywhere else. America went on to wage its war of independence over an increase on taxation without an increase in representation, despite the fact that they were allowed to run the colonies however they wanted. And when it gained independence, it was the most free and democratic country in the world at the time. In Pennsylvania, all men, regardless of race, class, land ownership, or lack of land ownership, could vote, and the more exclusive states later realized their hypocrisy and expanded the vote, or were forced to do so. Moving on to after World War II, Europe experienced shortages of food, healthcare, and excesses of chaos. And who did everyone turn to? Why, their governments, of course. Everyone, citizens and veterans alike, needed medical attention, and they needed it immediately and cheaply, free if possible. And slowly but surely, almost all parties agreed to devote attention and funds to social welfare. And the communist countries in the East built a social welfare system because of ideology. To prove that they were better than the capitalist countries because they cared for their citizens. But also simply because people, much like in Western Europe, wanted this healthcare on a national or federal level. The United States faced a different post-war reality and wasn't nearly as devastated as Europe was. Then, during the Cold War, it led the capitalist 
capitalist world against the forces of communism, so the Red Scare was much bigger in the United States than in any European country. Lyndon B. Johnson was one of the first presidents who was devoted to making federal health care a thing, but his funds and attention got distracted by Vietnam. My first announcement is that I'll only publish one video every two months until I reach 1,075 subscribers, or if 10 of you say that you will support me on Patreon, I will make a Patreon, and when those 10 of you start supporting me on it, I'll go back to a more regular video schedule. And there will be benefits to you supporting me on Patreon, like getting to see my vids early, or getting to ask me what if questions about history that I'll do my best to try and answer ever so often. And if any of you try any funny business like stopping supporting me after one month or whatever, I'll go back to publishing one video every two months. It's been very demotivating for me to be putting all this hard work into making these videos for so long without being monetized. I thought I would be monetized by now, so if you want me to keep making videos then subscribe and get more people to subscribe, but make sure you see at least three minutes before you subscribe and watch a little bit more after you subscribe unless you didn't subscribe until you finished the video or else Yuji will punish me. And leave a comment letting me know if you want me to make more videos on actual or alternate history and if you like the idea of the digital clock displaying info or if you think I should go back to just writing it on the screen. Or and tell me if you liked this country ball style I tried. Do you think I should keep using it or go back to the old style or any other suggestions? I'll be streaming Shadow of Rome on Twitch on the 26th. The time that I'll start streaming will be in the description.